Okay, so thanks so much uh, for coming to my talk. And it's interesting going last because you have to kind of absorb everything that's been said and kind of apply it to your system. And uh, I'm going to be talking about our work in the upper St. Lawrence River, specifically in the Thousand Islands region. So this is... Uh, so this is where Lake Ontario drains uh, into the, the upper St. Lawrence River. So we're, oops, that's not supposed to show yet. <laughs> Come on, guys. I'm working with what I got. All right, all right. So isn't that a lovely face? <laughs> But uh, so we're, it's interesting because there's some big changes that happen with the kind of the physics and the, the stratification of the system. In Lake Ontario, we just heard a lot from Brian about that system. You know, it's a huge deep basin and then it drains directly right at Cape Vincent into the upper St. Lawrence River and the, the St. Lawrence River doesn't have that stable stratification so that it's, it's mixed. We do have some relatively deep water up to about 70 meters. You know, not obviously like Lake Ontario, but there's there's some really interesting differences, yet they're so close together. And we're at the outlet of the entire Great Lakes. Um, also, our program is really focused on coastal uh, systems. We're, we're, we're a near shore sampling group primarily. So I think we have some things to add about uh, round Gobi dynamics. We heard um, from Chris about the tributary work. We've heard from the big lake work and, and some other studies. So we're going to talk about some coastal marsh work with brown goby and, and this picture of a giant goby. Um, I've seen some data on big gobies, but I think we may have the biggest gobies in the system. And they're not deep, so it's, it's very different than from what we just heard from Brian. Uh, so, to advance, there we go. So, you know, I've heard a lot of love around Gobi too in this meeting, which is surprising. Rogers back there used to say, Gobi good, Gobi bad, you know, we'll find out. But, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, analogies that kind of are political situation right now. So with brown Gobi, it's an aggressive, invasive species, kind of reminds me of immigration. Donald Trump, I don't know, but anyhow, we want to, are we going to make the river great again with this species? We're going to convert energy from these dry synods, bring it back up into the food web. So I want to talk a lot about like trade-offs, and, and I want to recognize my uh, colleagues here, uh, John Paul LeBlanc, uh, Andrew Miano, who did a lot of uh, master's work on borrowing a lot of other past students' data, and then the group here out of the Cornell uh, Vet College uh, works a lot with Gobi and DHSB dynamics, so we want to talk about that. So, uh, the Thousand Islands fishery, we're based more on warm and cool water species, so because we don't have that stratification I mentioned, we don't have like the Salmonid uh, fishery, it's more of a native warm and cool water species fisheries, northern pike, walleye, the, the bass species, a lot of panfish, and also of course muscalunge is kind of our signa signature, signature species. It's a, a huge economic driver in the region. And, and the system isn't necessarily stocked, so it's dependent on natural recruitment. So a lot of these other systems we're discussing depend on stocking. We have big hatchery systems for cold water species. Uh, this one's dependent on natural recruitment. Uh, it's managed by uh, Region 6 out of Watertown, and some of the staff are here. But it's also an international system, so we have DEC, uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. And it's kind of under this amazing management group, which is through the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission uh, and the Lake Ontario Committee that meets a lot. And, and there's some really big issues here. It's an international water, and it's, it's, it's kind of the St. Lawrence Seaway, which connects the Atlantic Ocean with the upper lakes. And, and we heard uh, also recently, Plan 2014, people have probably heard about, it's managed by IJC water levels. So there's a lot of associated perturbations by being a major thoroughfare uh, in the history of North America uh, that, that play a big role here. So just as a quick overview, I want to talk about potential round goby effects and, and these trade-offs I mentioned. Um, we have some uh, round goby trends like everyone else. I, I've seen some great data, but ours is uh, based in some of the nearshore surveys that we've been doing uh, for muscalonge and other fish species where round goby have showed up. Um, we're going to take some, a specific look at uh, some data uh, on round goby effects on fish condition. Um, we hear a lot about uh, round goby as an egg predator. I don't see a lot of data about it. People talk about it and we've done a couple studies on egg predation. 
and diet, and then we're going to talk about disease ecology. This is absolutely impossible to cover all this information, but I, so I'm, I'm giving you a flavor about some of the work that we're doing and some thoughts about future directions. So thinking about these trade-offs, we have these incredibly uh, fat bass in the system. Um, people see that as a real pro. They're eating, they're converting the muscles. Uh, they've altered the food web balance, bringing uh, dracinids back into the food web. Uh, they've, they've increased the uh, predation condition and growth uh, and buffering uh, cormorant uh, consumption, which we have a lot of cormorant colonies in the uh, TI region that have had impacts on fisheries. And then we're balancing that with a bunch of these cons, which we hear a lot about egg predators, out-competing native species. A new one that I haven't seen until now is the vector for BHSV. We're going to discuss, and that's a major one. Uh, we heard from Randy about effects on angling. I saw something on contaminants. I don't have that, but it's, it's also a source that uh, the Great Lakes are spreading to other systems. So more and more people are going to have to deal with this. So this is some of our data, and this is data from our, our spring trap map, which targets muscalage. Okay, so these are three and six foot depth coastal wetlands that harbor muscalunge. And we started getting gobies in our trap net uh, in 2007. And we have uh, uh, two uh, saning surveys, one in July and one in August. And we've, we've seen this uh, impressive increase in goby uh, densities in our nursery sites for muscalunge. And uh, we see a high degree of uh, correlation. The correlation coefficient between these data sets is like 0.92. So we think we're tracking what's going on with gobies in, in this musky nursery habitat, which is a pretty typical healthy coastal embayment type environment. Um, unlike Chris, when we sample tributaries, we don't see a lot of gobies in our Drown River Mouth tributaries. So it's, it's different than what has been observed here in Lake Erie. Um, Another interesting thing, and this is data from Andrew Miano, uh, we did uh, minnow trap surveys, and these are like the typical size distribution uh, from this length frequency for minnow trap catch. And take a look at this. This is our Oneida trap net catch for, for round goby. So when we check our musky nets, we're finding these massively sized gobies. Here's an example here. So they, they get really large in this, in this near shore environment. And this is a sample from the same embayment at the same time. So the, these fish were present at the same time in, in three different musky uh, bays. And, and we're seeing really large in, in, individuals. And it's kind of interesting that the deeper you go in Lake Ontario, you see big gobies. But here in a shallow embayment, we see large gobies. So we're really interested in that. So, this is the kind of outcome you can get. I guess you'd stick that in the pro column pretty quickly. <laughs> uh, this is that uh, tying the Lake Erie record smallmouth. So this is a big deal. You know, you want to have the, the biggest fish come from your water body. Maybe not, but, uh, you know, certainly the economics want you to. So that's an eight-pound, four-ounce smallmouth bass. And I'd be willing to guess that it's eaten some round gobies in its lifetime to get that big. So. My student, uh, Derek Crane, and I want to make a call out to the DEC for their exceptional warm water assessment database that's been managed out of Region 6 for many years. Uh, it's a gillnet survey. It's incredibly uh, standardized and well, well done, and we've made great use of this database. So they collect it, and we analyze it. And between our two surveys, uh, the ones going on out of Tibbs and out of Watertown, we've got this system fairly well covered in terms of assessment. So uh, Derek Crane, one of my students, took this data and he, he looked at uh, a study on condition and, and these three uh, regression lines through the, or, or power functions through the uh, length-weight relationship show differences between these three time periods. And the time periods represent like a pre synod baseline the Dracinid period and then the Round Gobi period for, for the upper St. Lawrence River, and we see significant differences in growth trajectory. Um, interestingly, he, he used a method that's kind of uh, sophisticated, it's called quantile regression. So a good way to think about it is you're looking at a specific uh, length class. You can see 230, 315, 390, and 470 millimeters. And then you're looking at all the individuals divided up into quantiles. So these are really poor conditioned fish, and these are really good conditioned fish. 
that exist within that size cohort. And it's a really neat way to look at more of the individual basis and differences. Um, and you can use it in a variety of contexts. And, and Derek Crane and I have a publication coming out in uh, a Canadian journal. Uh, it should come out this month or next month. But what we see is when we compare those three time periods, you can see the, the uh, baseline early period and the zebra mussel period kind of uh, separating from the goby period. So we can see a significant goby effect on that cohort of fish. And we also see a similar thing with the larger ones. But then you can kind of see some differences here. So for the, the uh, what we really were interested in is we see a significant difference emerging for the, the zebra mussel, the jacinid period, affects positive effects on condition in, in smallmouth bats. So it, it told us something that we didn't really realize is that there were effects of dracinids on bass as well. Um, another study that we worked on was this egg predation I mentioned. So if you're a centrarchid, for instance, you're, you're nesting in a variety of different habitat types. This is the work of Christina Calori. She was a master's student. We we're interested in how these different, uh, oops, I'm sorry, these different uh, habitat types that fish choose to nest, how that interfaces with their risk to predation by Ron Gobi. So does it matter where you nest and, and your risk to, to Ron Gobi predation? So here's my video. Is this possibly going to work? <laughs> there it goes. Hey, it worked. <laughs> so anyhow, she went out and removed the garden mail from the nest and looked at uh, predation influences on nests. And she did this for uh, 120 different fish, individual fish. We measured habitat variables and we counted all the predators. She actually caught the predators, evacuated their stomachs, and counted the eggs. It was just an amazing study. Um, and, and round gobies in certain habitats have a huge influence. You can also see a perch here. So there's other predators. So when we look at the, the number of predators per nest for, for three centrarchids, pumpkin seed, rock bass, and smallmouth, it's interesting because we, we, one thing to note along the X is there's a diversity of, of types of native predators in addition to round goby, but you can see that this bar just jumps off the chart and the importance of, of round goby as an egg predator. The other thing that we see is not so much for pumpkin seed. So we know that pumpkin seed are more of a, a wetland vegetated spawner and, and it doesn't seem like the, the round goby overlapped with that habitat enough to create an egg predation response is one explanation. Um, but we see a huge effect on, on, on species that are on hard substrates, uh, cobbles, sands, gravels, uh, building nests that, that have a lot of uh, exposure to round goby, and we're seeing a big effect there. So this is another study, a colleague of mine, Dave Phillip, uh, you know from uh, um, his work with black bass, and he had studied an island in the Thousand Islands near uh, Gananoque, and uh, this is Slim Island, and he actually mapped the nest distribution uh, for smallmouth bass in two different years uh, shown by these blue and uh, slightly darker blue dots and they were in this shallow cove over very hard substrates. Well, uh, Jeff Eckerlin and myself and, and Dave, we went back and we surveyed these, uh, this same area uh, more recently and we found that the bass are spawning much deeper than they did historically and they kind of, there's been some changes with algae and the other big change was high, high goby densities in the system. So this is kind of a, a peak, it hasn't had an effect. So we, he measured the total number of nests, he measured next, nest success, and that was determined by the, the number of black fry produced. That's a typical thing that you can measure, so we're not going as far as like year class formation. And he also interestingly measured hooking wounds. Um, that's when an angler catches the bass, they leave a little mark. And we saw kind of a, a slight decline in nests with the more recent period, but the thing that really jumped out was the number of successful nests dropped by uh, at least 50%, a little better than 50%. The, the number of fry produced was lower, and look at the increase in hooking wounds. So we've seen a lot of changes in the river with water clarity and other things that might explain that. 
But another possibility is the hyperabundance of round goby that is now associated with these nests and also associated with increasing fishing, site fishing on nests that may make them vulnerable to uh, predation. So this is, uh, a, so that was looking at nesting species. We we're also very interested in these uh, broadcast spawners, so like northern pike and musclunge where they have no parental care, they just are broadcast spawning kind of like a lake trout does. This is Andrew Miano who, who graduated last year. You've probably seen some of this data because he's presented it here. But he did a uh, controlled experiment. He put gobies in all these treatments. And, and we put uh, uh, eggs of northern pike and musclunge in these treatments. And we wanted to look at the complexity of the substrate and how that interfaced with uh, consumption. So, you know, when you get a nest, it's like, a, it's like the Goldilocks thing again. It's a pot of gold. A, a fisherman pulls off the bass. We know about Steinhardt's studies that the bass exhibit, exhibits more energy trying to guard those nests in the presence of gobies. But when you pull the bass off, we knew that the gobies could come in and eliminate that nest in a very short amount of time. In this case, you have no parental care. So the, the broadcast spawners, can they find the eggs in complex substrates? And what we found is that there was a significant uh, habitat effect. Um, the, the downward slope of this shows that there is some protection with more complex uh, substrates like your gravel and your filamentous algae and submerged aquatic vegetation. But it's still, when you look at these means, was still over 50% of the eggs that were put in the treatment were, were found and consumed by round goby. So it's very concerning that a goby in the environment could just find an egg that's been scattered around. So there's, there's more work that needs to be done on egg predation. Um, looking at another trade-off, I want to talk a little bit about VHSV. I think Rod's in the audience. He knows a lot more about this than I do, but we've been working with it uh, with Paul. Bowser and, and Rod and his group, and also uh, Emily Cornwell has done amazing studies looking at uh, VHSV. It's a rhabdovirus that came in the system about the same time as round goby, which is almost too ironic. There's no uh, formal connection that's been made uh, with that, but it caused a massive die off our, of our muskie population I spoke about last year. Um, and it's a rhabdovirus uh, reported in 2005. Uh, muskies are extremely sensitive to this. There's been experiments done at Michigan State. And another alarming thing is the, the, this is mutating. So the virus is changing. I think they're up to 84 different uh, uh, variants on this virus. So one of the things Rod's interested in is how this virus is changing over time. So you don't hear in the newspaper about VHSV like you did uh, when this thing was having this outbreak with these amazing fish floating up dead. But it, the fact is, is it's still in the system. It's very persistent in the system, and it's had uh, a significant impact. So this is our one of our signature surveys. It's our saning uh, for young of the year muscalunge. There's not many surveys like it. Each one of these these bars represents about 90 sane hauls that we do in a standardized index, and uh, you know we were seeing really strong. Uh, year class production of young muscalunge. This is our July and August survey. Here's what it looks like with the teams going out. And we're seeing uh, really good numbers on the nursery grounds. And then this is the round goby CQE. And you can see we're not seeing such good success anymore. So, you know, with a lot of these, you look at the Spearman's correlation coefficient, and you might assume, oh, gobies are having this direct effect on, on muscalunge, but we think it's much more complex than that. So the, the VHSV has killed off the spawning adults that have a site fidelity to these specific spawning and nursery grounds. Uh, we're seeing a collapse in the number of adults. We think that there's fewer eggs being spawned. Like I mentioned, there's a, a spawning site fidelity. So we're seeing much lower numbers coming off these nursery grounds. And it's getting kind of scary. And uh, surveys have been expanded uh, to other regions, and they're also seeing this pattern. So in, uh, we're kind of interested if gobies are having other effects, like maintaining the virus in the system, and also effects on the prey. So um, here's some other data. This is from Rod's lab, where they do quantitative uh, PCR to determine what we call prevalence of the virus in the system. And we've been monitoring gobies and other species in these musky bays. 
And, and what we see is uh, some, some dynamics with the, the levels of uh, virus that's in the system, but we see these really high bars of round goby uh, VHSV prevalence. So there's probably, or potentially, some interaction between uh, round goby and uh, the spread of this virus and the maintenance of this virus. It's, it's function is a, a viral reservoir. So if you think about epidemiology and the disease triangle, the relationship you know, between the host and the environment and the pathogen, uh, round goby makes a lot of sense to be a, a real competent reservoir for the virus. It's, it's stressed, which can cause viral outbreaks because it, it's spawning continually. It's um, exposed to all, it can expose predators through predation. So every time a predator eats a goby, if it's shedding active virus, it could contract that. So there's a big risk associated with transmission. So you can think those vectors could be really strong. And it's also ubiquitous. It's throughout the entire system. So it could be exposing the entire fish community in many cases to VHSV. So this is, you know, take a hold on your, your love of gobies because, Roger, because, <laughs> you know, there's more to the story. And when you see all those dead muscalons that could be related to this, that's not a good thing, obviously. So um, here's another thing. You know, if you ask all instead I, I love that fish personally, you know. People, you know, we look at slimy sculpins and changes. Uh, this is our uh, darter catch. Looks like a lot of other people's data. We used to catch a lot of darters. But look how that correlates with the rise of goby in our, our near shore areas. So uh, darters are becoming rare. Uh, we still find a few. Uh, but these, uh, these fish that are benthic fish, functional analogs, seem to be disappearing. We've lost our slimy sculpins as well. But it turns out that this is a very important prey for young of the year muscle. 14% of their diet. And even after the crash of muscle in our nursery areas, we still see positive selection for this fish, even though we can hardly find it ourselves. We're still finding it in the guts of muscle. So they, they really need this fish to be around. They'll eat goby, but we're just not seeing their. These are more terete, so it's kind of a different body form. So I just don't see goby as a great prey, but they'll, they'll eat a lot of things. Um, so earlier from Eric, we saw one of these Admondson diagrams. I'm moving on to diet. Um, we compared, remember those small and large gobies in the same sites I mentioned? So this is uh, Andrew's data. But we compared diet uh, for small and large gobies that came from these uh, three bays at the same time. And you remember the Admondson diagram, so we can, we can look at this uh, feeding diagram. So it's the frequency of occurrence versus the prey-specific abundance. And it shows you whether a prey item, if it's in this quadrant, it's specialized versus generalized. This is rarity versus dominance. This is between and within what they call phenotypic component. So it's kind of like the functional grouping of individuals within a grouping or between grouping numbers. And, and what we see for the, the small versus large is a couple things I want to point out. You can see for the small, here's the Dracinidae, they're important, but uh, chironomids were, were extremely important in their diet. There was a, quite a, a variety, trophic omnivory here going on with a lot of different things they're eating. Eggs was part of this data set, so we know they're eating eggs. But when we look at the large fish, we see some shifts. Um, so uh, we see more uh, dracinids here, and we also see the chironomids drop down. So what, what we took a look at this with uh, isotope data, and we've heard a lot about this, and I'm not going to dwell on it because Brian did such a nice job talking about the value of isotopic data. So that we know it's a snapshot when we look at the diet. We collect some fish. That's a snapshot of what they ate in the last you know, 24 hours. This integrates over time. Um, so it gives you a picture of a longer time period. We heard from uh, Eric, the fin versus the blood is like a turnover thing, and you really need the, we, we do have the prey isotopic uh, signatures, so we can relate this to prey, which I'm not showing now uh, because of time constraints. But what we do see is that these two groups between small and large gobies and the same embayment separate. So we're seeing, uh, with, with respect to trophic position, uh, the, the small gobies, which are over here on the left, uh, interestingly, usually when fish get larger, they increase in trophic position, and we saw actually the opposite. So, and that's consistent with the diet. 
Uh, the larger gobies tended to eat more dracinids. It shows even better with uh, carbon, which is indicative of source. This is more indicative of trophic position. But sourcing shows uh, you know, quite a range here for the small. And then look at the large. They're, they're really specializing on dracinids, and that, that's what was driving down uh, their, their uh, delta uh, 13 carbon signature. So in the same site, and we're learning more and more about the dynamics of these gobies, and it might be linked to movements. So when I say this is integrative, we don't know about movements. So these fish could be going deeper, they could be shallow at specific times of year. So when you're integrating, you're also integrating movement, which is an important point. So burning thoughts and questions, there's a lot of uncertainty still. So this is, yeah, like we said to the funding agencies, uh, we need to continue looking at this, about effects on native fish populations. There's trade-offs for growth and condition versus these mortality effects uh, associated with predation. Uh, there's a round goby influence on the food web, uh, but it also may help perpetuate VHSB. So there's a caveat here that's very important. Um, you know, if you're a native functional, functional analog to a goby, you're probably losing. Uh, there's probably other species beyond slimy sculpin and darters that, that have significant effects that need to be considered. Um, one question I have here is, is the round goby population regular, regulated by predators? We talked about how they might regulate dracinids, but in terms of like management options, is this the new alewife? You know, now we manage alewife to, to sustain fisheries. Um, we're, we're actually protecting alewife at this point to maintain our fisheries. Gobies are also an important prey item, and uh, they, the only way you can manage an invasive species that's, that's this, is a, this abundant and this well suited to our system is, is probably through predation demand. So the, the kind of catch-22 is if we're depressing recruitment, at the same time we're trying to manage higher predator biomass to regulate the species, those two things aren't congruent. So are we gonna, have, gonna be able to have our cake and eat it too where we, where we can uh, still have natural recruitment and also have high predator biomass without like stocking interference like we do in the Great Lakes system with the cold water fisher. So that's uh, pretty much it for today. I just wanna acknowledge all the, the groups and people that make our research possible. Uh, there's so many, the students and staff that do a lot of this research, uh, DEC, uh, through our Environmental Protection Fund grant, the FEMREF, our work with all our partners, uh, many of which are here today. I appreciate your time and would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. So we lost our moderator. But, uh, <laughs> Jim? So John, when you were showing the, the muskie versus when the gobies arrived, it looked like the muskies were sliding down before the gobies got there. Could, could VHS have been transmitted yeah. again? It's a really good point because I don't think, yeah, I don't think the gobies the whole story. There's a lot of confounding factors like changes in habitat. Um, you know, the VHSB might have come on before we detected it. Maybe gobies too. Um, you know, there's a lot of complexity in the system. There's water level regulation, there's been development, we have uh, um, some uh, filamentous algae species that are impacting the habitat. So we've done studies with stocking that we compared before and after, and, and the fish that we've stocked have not performed as well as they did historically before these uh, perturbations. So there's probably an erosion going on as well. Who's the moderator of this session? Yeah, you just come on, do your job. Any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Farrell, very much. And thank you, a great session. If everybody could go out into the um, march right out there, ready to announce the winners. And Erica, make sure you go out there. <laughs>